Awesome job. Um, so our next speaker, uh, Christine, while she's coming up, just so you guys know, I'm not checking email. I'm furiously tweeting here. Um, so I'm, uh, uh, I'm using the hashtag suicide prevention WS for suicide prevention workshop. So for anyone that's you know, I'm, I, I'm not really multitask. I truly am listening and synthesizing, and I encourage you all also to participate because I. One of the big things here uh, is making sure we're not limiting ourselves to this very brainy academic space. We need to spread this discussion out into the rest of the universe. So I strongly encourage you guys to to also follow along, tweet what you're listening to. So without further ado. Great, thank you and good morning. It's my pleasure to be here and thank you so much to the National Academies for choosing to take a focus on this important public health um, crisis that we're in in the United States. I'm Christine Moutier. I serve as um, the Chief Medical Officer for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And I came to dedicate myself to, solely to suicide prevention um, through a, a series of personal and professional events that really started with my own crisis that opened my eyes to the culture within academic medicine that was incredibly um, obstructive to receiving our own mental health treatment as healthcare providers. So physician and healthcare provider suicide prevention remains a passion of mine. And, and then um, as the opportunity arose to extend that passion to the national uh, problem of suicide prevention, that of course has been an incredible um, gift and an honor to be part of this movement. The only real disclosure to share is that the organization that I work for, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, does fund a significant portion of the science related to suicide and suicide prevention. And we use a peer-reviewed process, just like the NIH. But that does mean that we're very involved um, in the science and hoping to um, further the science and disseminate findings. And the acknowledgments here are really to some very generous colleagues of mine who um, did quite a bit of the research and then generously shared the research with me when I entered the field. So I will be talking about uh, more national trends, um, and thank you to Dr. Wilcox for that fantastic overview. I'll be The national trends that I'm going to cover are a little bit more focused on the public's perception of mental health and suicide prevention and what that has to do with the healthcare system um, and the demands that uh, will be appropriately placed on health systems. I'll talk about evidence-based treatment that can reduce the risk of suicide for um, anyone who has that risk of suicide. I will very briefly cover a national goal to reduce the United States uh, rate of suicide 20% by 2025 through a business-like strategy called Project 2025. And I'll end by talking about the gaps that exist and, and hope to cover some solutions. So just to cover more of the national trends, at the national level, we see that public perception is opening up um, quite beautifully around mental health and suicide prevention, um, but it's not enough to have open-mindedness. We need to deepen the mental health literacy of our nation as a next step. But I think there are some reasons we can look to as to why culture is changing so dramatically around mental health. First of all, the science around mental health, um, psychology, psychiatry, neuroscience, and suicide have all been growing tremendously um, over recent decades. And the dissemination of the culmination of that science is being um, promoted, I think, more actively these days. And that is translating to public knowledge. And that, of course, much more needs to happen in that regard. The idea that mental health is a legitimate aspect of human health, that mental health exists on a continuum, just like all axes of health and physical health, um, that is now being understood, I think, more so. Again, more needs to happen. Within um, the world of, of suicide prevention, the movement has gained momentum, um, again, with advocates like Taryn and others speaking out. That includes people, though, with the experience of suicide loss, the experience of their own personal lived experience of suicide attempt or ideation, and many, many others, us, um, policymakers, healthcare providers, and scientists. 
And also within the field of suicide prevention, there's now more collaboration and consensus about what constitutes effective prevention than ever before. So those are some of the reasons as I see it. And now I'm gonna show you just some examples of data points that might um, indicate how public perceptions are changing. Along with the Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention, we at AFSP sponsored a Harris poll, actually just um, repeated it over the last couple weeks, and it found that the vast majority of American adults view physical health and mental health as equally valid and important. The vast majority of American adults would do something to help someone if they knew that they were at risk of suicide. Now they also said they wouldn't be sure of what to do or what to say, so they need more knowledge, but they want to do something. And the majority of American adults also feel that suicide is preventable. The lexicon has been changing, as we heard from Taryn. This is really important, as science has shed light on the fact that Suicide should not be considered anything other than the health issue and outcome that it is with genetic, environmental, and other um, psychosocial and health underpinnings. So a couple of years ago, the Associated Press actually changed their style book, official recommendations, um, regarding the words that journalists use to talk about and report on suicide. So the phrase committed suicide is no longer recommended, uh, recommended by, by many, including um, the Associated Press. And so using plain language like died by suicide, killed himself, or ended her life, those are all uh, more acceptable ways to talk about suicide. One small but significant example of the culture changing is the fact that our Out of the Darkness Walks, which began as a fledgling um, awareness and fundraising activity 15 years ago, have grown tremendously over these years. They started at a time when families and people were not sure that they could say the word suicide out loud in public, and now hundreds of thousands of people are coming out to use their voice um, and to raise awareness. And for the last several years, this is remarkable, it's been among the fastest growing awareness and fundraising events in the US. For the first time in history over the past decade, numerous state laws that uh, mandate suicide prevention training and suicide prevention policies and practices um, across many different industries have passed um, among the states. These include for K-12 schools, colleges and universities, and also calling for enforcement of parity, very, very important um, state-based enforcement of that federal law that's more than a decade old now. Additionally, 13 federal laws have passed over the last decade that um, indicate significant reform for suicide prevention. And I just want to show you what um, many of us who are involved in suicide prevention are teaching the public about suicide. There's an education program called Talk Saves Lives that we developed at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention that is now being delivered over the last couple years to tens of thousands of people in all 50 states. Um, this is our suicide prevention sort of 101 program, Talk Saves Lives. We say that suicide is a complex health issue. We teach the public that despite its complexity, suicide can be prevented. We teach people about the scope and epidemiology of suicide, about what research shows drives up suicide risk and constitutes effective suicide prevention. We teach people that everyone has a role to play in suicide prevention, which always culminates in teaching the public to bring people who are at risk for suicide to a healthcare provider and to the health system. Just as we want people to come to healthcare settings at the earliest indication that they might have diabetes or any other kind of health problem, we also want people at the earliest stages of their sense of deterioration in mental health or suicide risk to come to receive health care. So the healthcare systems need to know what to do, just as we do for other health problems. We teach people about limiting access to lethal means, especially during periods of risk. 
And these are just some examples of um, education materials that are being disseminated at walks and fa health fairs, um, really all over the place, um, health systems, but also in other industries now, including workplaces, which is a new and really important um, place that's taking on suicide prevention as well. Okay, I'm going to shift my focus now and talk about treatment. So there are some innovative ways to think about clinical treatment as it relates to suicide prevention. So first of all, there are newly developed, studied, and evidence-based ways to reduce the risk of suicide. These treatments did not exist several decades ago, and nor were they studied or targeted for people with suicidal ideation and behaviors. These need to be um, made much more accessible to the public. There are also now brief interventions that are being widely utilized, such as safety planning, lethal means counseling, and other brief interventions that can be done during one outpatient visit or during an emergency department visit. The role of technology, we've already heard from Holly a little bit about the importance that, uh, that technology is playing, um, but particularly in terms of treatment, some treatment modalities and peer support are now available um, through online, and the use of predictive analytics to help guide um, treatment and outreach is a very important um, new and cutting edge aspect of the science that's going on, not just science, but practice as well. Oh, and um, additionally, healthcare systems um, really need to start thinking about suicide as a health-related outcome and measuring it and paying attention. So a thanks to Elizabeth Ballard for the use of this slide. There are critical windows of suicide risk um, that we need to be aware of, and these include um, when, when people's, uh, when epidemiologically and populations are looked at, but also for psychological autopsy, periods of transition, whether it is from um, a soldier being deployed, a soldier coming back, or a soldier transitioning to veteran status and civilian status, whether it is a middle-aged man who is transitioning um, because of job changes, economic changes, or marital um, changes, all of those constitute times of transition. And in the clinical setting, those transition times have proven time and time again to be enormously higher risk periods. And these include the days to weeks um, that follow discharge from a psychiatric unit, discharge from an emergency department, especially following presentation for suicidal ideation or attempt. Um, and also in the early stages of treatment and the early stages of identifying a new mental health condition. So those are times that we need to learn to pay attention to in the health system. Now I'm going to focus on several suicide risk reducing psychotherapies. I have on the screen listed several evidence-based treatments that are now shown to reduce the risk of suicide. I will only have time to really show you some data from the first two listed, DBT and CBT, and I apologize for that because the data is actually quite rich for all of these. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that we can do in the training of health care professionals is to get the word out, not that everyone obviously will be able to be trained in all of these modalities, but the knowledge that these exist and that patients who are at risk can be referred for specialized treatment is very important. When it comes to dialectical behavior therapy, there are several randomized controlled trials and I'm, on the slide here is just one landmark study, but let me first describe the, the larger picture for DBT. There are randomized controlled trials now for people with borderline personality disorder and a recent suicide attempt, cross-diagnostically for adults who've recently attempted suicide, people with substance use disorders, eating disorders, prepubescent children age 7 to 12 with disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, and adolescents with a suicide attempt history. So the literature, again, around all of these treatment modalities has really grown. In this landmark randomized control trial published by Linehan in 2006, 
um, 101 women with borderline personality disorder who had recently attempted suicide were followed for two years. They were randomized into one of two groups. They could either receive DBT or community therapy, um, community expert therapy for one year, um, but again, followed out for another year beyond that. And um, what you see here is that their rate of reattempt uh, was dramatically re reduced by about 50%. And um, they had significantly fewer hospitalizations as well. And in the adolescent study that I mentioned to you, DBT um, consisted of the full court press, which includes family skills and parent education. And that study among adolescents with uh, risk for suicide showed that their reattempt rate was reduced by 70%. So when it comes to cognitive behavioral therapy, um, I'll describe some of the data for you, but I will cut to the chase first by telling you that what a meta-analysis of all the randomized control trials of CBT tells us is that when CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, hones in on the individual's suicidal cognitions and behaviors, rather than only focusing on depression and anxiety, that is where it can be the most effective at reducing um, subsequent suicide attempts. So in this landmark randomized controlled trial by Brown and Beck, published in JAMA 2005, um, a, so a perfect survival curve would look like a straight line across here, a straight horizontal line, sorry, that's not very straight, that would mean that the treatment is working so perfectly that no one is reattempting in the study. But as that survival curve comes down, it shows that the, the um, suicide risk is, is still breaking through. But you can see that in this um, randomized control trial, this was with 120 adults seen in an emergency department after a suicide attempt, randomized to either 10 sessions of cognitive behavior therapy versus enhanced treatment as usual in the community. And again, in this CBT study, they targeted the suicidal cognitions of these individuals, and they were followed for 18 months. And you can see that the participants who received CBT were 50% less likely to reattempt suicide than the usual care group. Their depression scores were significantly lower um, than the usual care group. They had less hopelessness as well. And I want you to note that they had the same rate of suicidal ideation. So people can live with suicidal thoughts, but have the quality of their mental health and their behavior changed significantly. Um, so this is, this is really a, a kind of a new way to think about it, and I think for many clinicians, we have not learned these things, and we have avoided honing in on our patients' suicidal thoughts because it scares us, and probably for other reasons, we're always rushed for time, but this, this really needs to start being incorporated as a part of treatment. Okay, um, sorry to um, embarrass you, Dr. Rudd, by putting your photo up there, but I thought it was important to also show that many of these modalities can be modified and retain their value. And so CBT was modified and customized for an Army soldier uh, group at Fort Carson by Drs. Rudd and Brian into a brief form of CBT. And this is just so powerful. Um, published in American Journal of Psychiatry in 2015, this is a study um, of, again, active duty Army soldiers who were either post-suicide attempt or with suicidal ideation with intent. And over a two-year follow-up period, the group that received the brief CBT had their suicidal um, suicide attempts uh, risk reduced by 60%. And a meta-analysis of CBT targeted at suicidal ideations and behaviors overall shows this level of effect size in reducing risk. A left shift beyond that vertical line means that subsequent suicidal behaviors were reduced. So you can see that in five of the six of these studies, it did have that um, quite powerful reduction of suicide risk. Okay. Just a 
a fairly brief word about medications. And I should actually mention that I chose to hone in on some of these treatment modalities um, that, that we need to highlight. It is not, this is not comprehensive, though. I'm not talking about ECT or TMS or some other treatment modalities that certainly have a place um, for suicide risk reduction. But when it comes to the approach with medications, there are some ways to think about our patients um, and our patient care. Um, and the first is to realize that patients don't just simply declare their suicide risks. So when we're thinking about suicide risk among patients, we probably need to be thinking about our approach in general in the clinical setting. And, and the, the second thing I would say is that, yes, like usual, certainly maximize their treatment, whether it's medications or anything else, to optimally manage their primary psychiatric condition or conditions. That's, of course, the way we're trained. That's, that's the easy part. The new part is to now think also about suicide-specific considerations for your patients. So, for example... I think a very underutilized medication when it comes to reducing suicide risk is lithium. There is an incredibly robust literature that shows that lithium compared to other mood stabilizers and other medications, both for bipolar disorder and unipolar mood disorders, reduces the risk of suicide attempts and death by suicide between 60 and 80 percent. I mean, that, that's a robust finding, and yet um, lithium is not being utilized all that, uh, all that frequently. Clozapine is the only medication with an FDA indication specific to suicide risk reduction, and that's for people with schizophrenia. When it comes to antidepressants as a class, I'll just say um, my opinion is that while the FDA black box warning may have had the unintended consequence of confusing the public and causing a lot of fear um, and also leading primary care doctors and others to undertreat depression in many instances, there is a place for antidepressants in terms of risk reduction for suicide. Um, I'll just leave it at that due to time constraints. There are also a newer class of medications, the NMDA blockers and, and um, related medications that um, are very exciting and some are, have received the FDA breakthrough therapy designation, meaning they've been fast-tracked because the data looks so positive. I'll show you, um, or I'll talk about just a couple of those NMDA active agents. So let's first start by talking about ketamine. Um, ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic from the 1960s with more recent evidence that there, that NMDA receptor antagonism can produce a, a therapeutic effect for treatment refractory depression and for possibly for bipolar disorder, um, but also now specifically with a rapid reduction in suicidal ideation. Um, starting at about in the first few hours by one day and being sustained until about one week out. And that effect on reducing suicidal ideation has been shown to be partially independent of whether or not the mood effect occurs, which is really fascinating to sort of separate out depression from suicidal ideation. The controversy around ketamine relates to the studies mostly being small scale, there, the potential abuse, uh, potential side effects such as dissociation, and the short, the relatively short length of therapeutic effect. And there are other medications similar to ketamine that are in the pipeline, including S-ketamine, which has an IV and intranasal um, formulation, rapastinol, and others. So the clinical approach, um, most of this I've mentioned already. Um, Yes, I think I, I've covered enough of this. Let me move on. Okay. So a brief word about Project 2025. Many um, of us in the field, including at AFSP, had set a bold goal several years ago to help serve as a catalyst to reduce the nation's suicide rate 20% by 2025. And um, as I mentioned, SAMHSA, NIMH, Action Alliance, CDC all adopted that same goal or have endorsed um, the goal and Project 2025, and some private entities have actually supported Project 2025. The four 
pathways for Project 2025 were landed on by a thorough analysis of the literature looking at which strategies can reduce really suicide rates and save lives the fastest if they were scaled up. Um, these four pathways hone in on communities who own firearms, and this is an education approach to massively infuse suicide prevention education into firearms owning communities. And the other three pathways for Project 2025 are all clinical settings, basically. Healthcare systems, e emergency departments, and corrections, which for now we've chosen to focus on healthcare within corrections. And um, I'm happy to say that there are now partners who have joined with our organization in each of these pathways because we as a nonprofit organization are not going to be able to accomplish this, but rather accrediting bodies and um, trade organizations and professional organizations within those industries can help adopt these strategies and um, either recommend, suggest, mandate, set new standards, and all of those things are happening across all of these um, pathways for Project 2025. I'll close by talking about the gaps and some solutions. So first and foremost, the most obvious that, that we all are well aware of is that when a federal investment is made in research in any leading cause of death in this nation, it generally produces payoff in terms of reduction in mortality rate. And we've seen that kind of investment for other um, leading causes of death. These are some examples of one-year funding for HIV AIDS research, heart disease and prostate cancer, and then a 10-year um, trend in mortality for those leading causes of death. And you can see that for suicide, the investment so far has been rather meager, and obviously the rate continues to rise. Another gap has been that we really never had standards of care for in clinical practice for approaching people at risk for suicide. Um, screening standards, care steps that can occur, and that um, those standard care steps have now been outlined thanks to the National Action Alliance and the working group that produced this document, which was released um, not too long ago. The other gaps that I'll just mention include, as I started by talking about deepening the mental health literacy of our nation so that people, families, um, we know how to recognize what a mental health change looks like. I'm talking about early upstream, maybe before a mental health condition has even manifested, um, and, and to know what to do about that, both in terms of treatment as well as supportive family and self-care strategies. We need more science across the board related to suicide, but I want to highlight one type of science, implementation science, that is um, that we really need because it helps us measure the impact and efficacy of both clinical treatments as well as community-based programs. We need to include people who are at risk for suicide in clinical trials instead of excluding them. We must have better surveillance and health systems can help us to capture suicide-related events and deaths, including um, payers. There will probably never be enough mental health professionals to go around for the population, so we need to find other ways to scale up mental health care and integrate it into primary care, the use of peer specialists, and other creative modalities like that. Collaborative care, certainly, um, we need more of. We need to be able to bill for services so that clinicians can actually perform these recommended care steps. Um, steps like safety planning, lethal means counseling, use of telepsych, telemedicine, and peer specialists. Some of those are not billable currently, and that is a major obstacle in the way of scaling up appropriate care. Lastly, of course, we need to enforce mental health parity. And by doing all of these things together, we can save lives and improve the quality of many more. And just closing with a step back up to the 30,000 foot level, we are gaining traction and creating a culture that is much more savvy about mental health and suicide prevention, and that's a wonderful thing. And that will appropriately place more demand on healthcare systems. I'll close there. Thank you. <laughs>